Hi, um, this is Mohammed Akram from Akram Insurance Advisory and Tax Firm. So we are here um, to have the webinar uh, insurance dedicated fund structure for efficiency. And um, I just want to go with to some housekeeping items that this uh, is a CPE uh, webinar. You will get the get the CPE, and uh, if you attempt three out of four questions during the period, and have to listen for 50 minutes. Um, second is that during this call, we will open our questions. So feel free to ask any question during the during the CP. We have a wonderful panel. I will let uh, give this to Greg. Greg, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, thanks, Mohammed. So I'll be um, your dedicated moderator for this um, uh, for this webinar. Um, uh, just to start, the program level is very basic. Uh, there's no prerequisites. You don't need any advanced preparation. Um, this is more of an introduction to uh, insurance dedicated fund structures and the benefits and um, and considerations to be made on um, on IDFs. And um, we're we're joined by a wonderful uh, uh, group of panelists today. So um, next slide, please, Mom. So to start, I'll, I'll uh, ask each one of these um, gentlemen to introduce themselves uh, and their firm and speak uh, a little bit about what they do um, and how they fit into the IDF world. Uh, to start, Dave, if you want to kick us off. Uh, sure, Greg. Uh, my name is Dave Reynolds. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at Spearhead Administrative Services. We're a third-party administrator that partners with RIA's asset managers, as well as various insurance companies in the private placements marketplace. And we enable RIA's and asset managers to create fund structures or separate managed account structures so that they can manage assets within the private placements marketplace. Um, we've been doing this for approximately a decade and work with uh, about 40 clients today. Perfect, thanks Dave. So um, uh, number two, Mohammed Akram. Um, Please introduce yourself and speak a little bit about Akram for those who may or may not know what you do. Thank you, Greg. Um, Akram is an assurance advisory and tax firm. We provide audit and tax services to hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, and family offices. And uh, we like to do more and more insurance dedicated fund audit and tax work. Great. And, um, and Adam. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Adam Hagfors, Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer for Silverview Credit Partners. Uh, we have an IDF um, focused on the lower middle market debt space. So Silverview specializes in loans between 10 and $30 million to small businesses and individuals. Perfect. And uh, a, a little bit about myself as well on FundViews. Um, you know, uh, FundViews Capital is a end-to-end -end, uh, provider that structures and operates uh, private investment funds for um, both asset managers, emerging managers, RAs, and family offices. Um, it can be fund of funds, feeders, SPVs, or, um, or full-fledged funds. Um, and I'm the managing partner of FundMuse Capital. We do not do anything in the IDF world, which is why I'm the moderator and not a speaker on this panel. <laughs> So to, to kick it off, um, you know, I, I'll uh, I'll just talk very quickly and, and rudimentally, uh, you know, what an IDF is. Um, so IDF stands for Insurance Dedicated Fund. It's a commingled fund structure managed by third-party asset managers. It's made in, made available for investment through insurance companies. So you're wrapping insurance around a, an asset of sorts. Um, clients allocate to IDF by funding first funding a variable like insurance or annuity contract called PPLI or PPBA. Um, to purchase a PPLI or PPBA contract, the client must meet the definition of an accredited investor or and qualified purchaser. So it's only for those that are qualified purchasers not um, or ultra high net worth uh, folks for uh, lack of better terms. Um, for tax sensitive investors, IDS allow them to invest in certain strategies in a long-term income tax deferred basis. And if structured properly, both income and estate tax are eliminated. For investment managers who oversee tax inefficient strategies, an IDF can function as a more tax 
friendly access point for their wealthy clients, improving net of tax returns and enabling the asset manager to attract and retain additional investor capital. So for, you know, in a nutshell, for ultra high net worth investors, which is a qualification requirement for IDF, um, you can safely assume they're probably in the top tax bracket of, of whatever state and, and jurisdiction they reside in. This is a way for them to invest um, through insurance contracts in order to get um, a better net income or a net net of um, return compared to what they uh, ultimately would get if they just invested in their taxable income. Um, Dave, I'll kick it over to you just to give your you know couple minutes thoughts on on what I messed up and what uh, insurance dedicated funds actually do and how they how they work before uh, maybe getting Adam's thoughts on on you know how they fit into the asset management world. Sure. No, I thought you did a great job. Um, think of think of IDS as funds that investors can allocate to. However, instead of investing like directly in a given investment manager's traditional LP or or LLC structure, the investor, you know, rather than writing a check to that fund manager, they're writing a check to an insurance company, and that that check is technically a premium into an insurance contract. And as Greg alluded to, it could be private placement life insurance, which is a an institutionally priced life insurance product or private placement variable annuity, which is an institutionally priced variable annuity. Um, and then once, once that contract is funded, the client can direct the insurance company to invest those assets into one or more underlying funds that are approved and offered by that carrier. And so there are, there are a variety of carriers that operate in this marketplace. Well-known carriers include names like Prudential, Zurich, Pacific Life, Crown Global, Lombard, Investors Preferred. So it is it is a relatively niche, but also a robust marketplace. And as Greg alluded to, these are these are products that are only available to the ultra wealthy. Um, you know, from a, a an income tax perspective, PPLI and PPVA are are very similar under the Internal Revenue Code to traditional variable life insurance or variable annuity products. Um, PPLI to life insurance qualifies under Section 7702 of the Internal Revenue Code as a variable life insurance product. Um, where these where these insurance contracts differ from traditional in, insurance products and annuity products are is that number one they're segregated account products and so the dollars inside the contract sit inside an investment account that's unique to a client's contract and then from there they can be invested in one or more investment options approved by the carrier. And two, they offer a tremendous amount of investment flexibility. And so to the extent that a client desires access to private credit or hedge funds or private equity or real estate, they can potentially access those strategies and, and their desired asset manager through one of these funds in IDF inside of their contract. So it's, it's a, another way of thinking that, about it is just changing the asset location of how a client makes an investment. There's an additional complexity in how they make the investment, but as you'll learn in the presentation, there are some, some tremendous tax benefits that can get passed on to the client as a result of that. Perfect. And uh, Adam would love to hear your thoughts on uh, you know, how IDFs fit into the asset management world, um, you know, maybe how common they are, because I know it's not, not every asset manager really even knows about them and, um, and, and what you've seen in the space. Absolutely. Um, they're not as common um, as one might think, especially when you see the tax advantage nature of the investment, um, and especially so in, in tax inefficient investments like credit. Um, with that said, we, we're pretty excited to be part of it. We think it's a great tool for our investors or a great option for them to choose from. Um, our IDF mimics our flagship master fund, our special situations lending fund two. And so you're getting the same exposure, same assets, uh, same dis diversification. However, it's wrapped in a more tax efficient strategy, which we think uh, just makes a lot of sense. And it's a nice option for those more sophisticated investors, the ultra high net worth types that can work uh, with the insurance companies to either get a, a PPLI policy or that PPBA policy. So we think it's a tremendous tool for us as an asset manager to have, and, uh, and it's definitely helped us touch uh, new new customer segments that uh, previously we weren't able to. Great, and uh, 
Lastly, Mohammed, do you want to speak to, um, you know, quickly to, to any thoughts and that you have on IBS? And I know, um, you know, you 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 audit a couple IBS and um, and look forward to auditing more in the future. Yes, uh, I don't want to steal the thunder from Dave and Adam. I think they're doing a good job, but um, I would say that um, they're going to discuss further down the road about the tax uh, saving they can they can get. But for me, like um, there's a huge demand from um, investors from living in high tech states to go into those products. And regarding audit and tax work, I don't think so. It is as different as you do a normal fund without the PPLI or PPVA, but you need to understand different differences and nuances so, so you can tweak or tailor your audit and tax approach. But overall, I don't think it is a big difference in the big uh, uh, audit and tax picture for us. Great. So I think we're uh, good to move on here. Um, so Dave, I'll ask you kind of to, to take us through how an insurance dedicated fund is formed. I think you're probably the right uh, right person for this one. Sure, Greg. Um, so creating an IDF is, is not dissimilar from creating any traditional LP or LLC fund structure. You know, it, 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 the IDF will have its own PPM, its own LPA or equivalent and subscription docs. You know, just like other fund structures, the IDF will also engage with traditional service providers. So your custodian, your NAV administrator, your auditor. Um, the only difference really is that the, the IDF has specific reporting and compliance requirements that the insurance company will require from, from the IDF itself, which we'll touch on later in the, uh, in the presentation. Yeah, but there are there are like certain niceties to how you build that structure so that it's it's amenable to insurance companies that are the end investors in the IDF itself. But you know, by and large, this is this looks and feels very similar to any other fund structure that a manager would create. Um, you know, it just has to be a segregated fund structure. You know, outside of other vehicles that a manager might oversee. Um, you know, as, as the slide alludes to, eligible investors in the IDF are insurance companies that technically are investing on behalf of individual policyholders. So when a, when a, a high net worth individual funds one of these contracts, they'll then instruct the insurance company, typically they're ticking a box on their application saying, hey, I'd like to, I'd like to allocate my segregated account assets inside my policy to one or more IDFs or other investment options offered by the carrier. And, and likewise, once an IDF is created, technically it has to be onboarded and approved by that insurance platform so that they'll, they'll allow the client to invest in the IDF. So the, the insurance company, likewise, on the back end, they want to review the IDF, make sure that the docs are in order, make sure that the, the IDF is structured properly and has the proper disclosures. Um, and really from a, a scale perspective, if you're if you're an asset manager, realistically you need 10 million or more of day one capital to create an IDF. Reason being, um, that'll create some scale where the costs associated with the IDF are not overly dilutive to those early investors. And also at that 10 million dollar level, it's worthwhile for the insurance company to onboard the IDF onto the onto their investment menu, you know, because typically they're seeing you know, new new premium dollars showing up on their doorstep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and Adam, just a very quick one. If you had to uh, put a number from, from one to 10, how difficult or not difficult was it going through that process, structuring your insurance dedicated fund? And, 10 being and, the most difficult and one being the least difficult. Yeah, I think it was like a three or a four. You know, we worked closely with Dave and his team who made it very easy um, to, to get through it. Uh, if you've done fund setups before, again, it's quite similar, and, and I would say definitely easier than a first-time fund, and you know probably even easier than even a follow-on subsequent fund. So um, they're able to take your existing documents and, and conform them into an IDF fashion. Um, so from that standpoint, it's pretty easy. Uh, the you know the most difficult part, at least from my take, is was just getting um, you know on board with the various carriers. But um, I didn't have to do any of that. I think you know, the Spearhead team really handles that and does an incredible job. So um we, we, we've been very pleased with that great um Greg, can i ask a quick question sure. yeah please we got uh, um um like 
question a lot from the prospects or the emerging managers who want to launch a ideal structure. They ask how much capital they should have, even it is it is a good for them to launch an idea. And second, um, different insurance carriers work with the different type of assets. So how they reckon differentiate these insurance insurance carriers for emerging managers versus sophisticated managers. If you guys check something out. Yeah, Mohammed, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, I, I mentioned the 10 million of, of day one or sight lines to 10 million of day one capital to launch the idea. That's one bogey, but also the carrier will do their own due diligence on the sub advisor or, or investment manager of that idea. And the carriers, generally speaking, want to see that the, the manager is SEC registered, that they have some scale to their business, several hundred million, if not more. Of, of AUM that they manage on a traditional taxable basis already, because at that size, they've proven their business stands alone on its own. They have a diversified client base and you know the, the carriers are incentivized to approve IDFs that they think can, can grow over time. And so they wanna work with managers that are established and you know, have several hundred million of AUM minimum. Thank you. Yeah, to, to piggyback off of that actually, Dave, um... You know, if if you're a manager, just to be clear, do the insurance companies bring you clients, or do you have to bring your own clients that kind of come through that? Or how how much marketing happens on the insurance company side if you were to create an IDF through a provider? Yeah, it's a great question. But I would say 99% of the marketing is going to going to fall on the asset manager. This is this is really a it's still a relatively novel marketplace. There are about 200 IDFs available today more broadly. And there's some very large institutional managers in the space, including you know, the Black Rocks, Golub, Aries, Millennium, some well-known managers in the alternative space. There are also a, like a handful of like mutual fund-like managers, like your, your vanguards that offer funds in this space. But mo most of that selling is done by the asset manager themselves. You're, there's an advantage to getting your IDF approved and offered on the carrier's investment platform. And the carriers will make that available to other policyholders. And some carriers even maintain portals where they, they provide updates to policyholders you know, across their the insurance carrier of how the different funds perform. But you know, most, of the, most of that lifting you know, fall, falls back to the asset manager to, to raise that capital. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I thought. Uh, all right. Uh, polling question number one, Mohammed, take us away. We will give them a, a minute or so to respond if they are interested in CPE. I'm going to close that poll within a few seconds. So most of the people responded to option C. So Dave, you are expert in that. Do you agree with them? Yep. Yeah, the, the end investor needs to qualify as an accredited investor or qual and qualified purchaser. Okay. Awesome. That's great. Perfect. Um, so Pros of an insurance dedicated fund structure, um, you know, on the, you know, on the, uh, hold on one second. Um, so, you know, this might be something I'll, um, I'll speak very quickly to, and then uh, I'll probably hand it off to you, Adam, in terms of um, uh, speaking more about this. But the pros, obviously, for the, the net, um, you know, in terms of the investor situation, right, the investor gets to invest in a tax deferred and tax eliminated uh, way, right? There's other pros such as elimination of K1 um, and varying applications for, for different types of investors like insurance companies themselves investing in, in IDFs and things like that. 
Um, but from the start, you know, I'd like to, to hand it off to Adam and speak about the, uh, the benefits um, from a different angle, right? From, from the private uh, asset manager, private fund manager's uh, point of view, what benefits are there for, a, for an asset manager to set up an IDF? Yeah, I think, you know, what the question was asked earlier, I think was discussed is, you know, is it, is it easy for a first time manager to raise capital from it? And, and I think a lot of asset managers, us included in our, in our earlier days, thought we, we should launch an IDF because we would just raise a bunch of money. Um, and I think that that's definitely not the right approach. You need to be much more thoughtful about it. And it's, it's really viewed as a tool to service your clients and provide your, your investors, um, you know, better tax structures and, and optionality. So I think that's just what you should think of. So from from my standpoint, the benefit is is being able to offer you know more tools in the quiver to my end clients. Um, I think that really is is the optimal uh, solution. It differentiates us from a lot of the managers um, in our space who aren't on IDFs. I think it also demonstrates a level of sophistication um, from the asset manager standpoint that we're knowledgeable and aware of these uh, items and these options. And it can be viewed as a solution provider, not only you know in providing good investments and good investment opportunities, but also being able to not naturally provide tax advice, but to be able to guide them that here here's some other options that you should speak with your tax advisor about um, for your potential investment opportunities. Perfect. And, and how often, Adam, do you see uh, investors that are all trying to work that either haven't seen IDS before or this might push them in that direction, right? To set up their own private placement uh, PPLI or PPVA um, setup. Yeah, it surprises me how um, few people have familiarity with it at this point in time. Which again, it's, it's, I think it's a it's a great way to look like a thought leader in the sec in this sector because it isn't um, as widely knowledgeable as as one would imagine. Uh, which is, I think, the you know the the fantastic aspect about being one of the earlier uh, asset managers in this sector. Um, you know, it's been around for years, yet hasn't been used as, as much as one would imagine. So um, we, we find that again is a huge advantage for us. Great, and Dave, anything to add on this in terms of, um, you know, we'll, we'll go through the tax advantage um, uh, section next, but um, anything to add in terms of an overall, um, you know, benefit to investors? No, I think, I think we, we've hit on it, you know, investments in an IDF through a PPLI or PPVA contract qualify for long-term tax deferred growth, which can extend as long as that insured is alive. So a lot of clients, a lot of wealthy clients will fund their PPLI or PPVA contract with the intention of owning it for the remainder of their lifetime. And they treat this as a tax efficient asset location on their balance sheet. This, this contract may, may, you know, this, this is almost their asset of last resort. They want to they want to allow these these dollars to compound tax efficiently the remainder of their lifetime, and they have they have full optionality through these contracts over when and and to what extent they they surrender or pull liquidity out of these contracts. And depending on its how it's structured and what their age is, that determines whether whether there are any you know adverse tax effects at that point when they pull the money out. But it, it very much increases clients' optionality for when and if they pay tax on their investment. Perfect, thanks. I think we're good for the next slide, Mark. So this slide is probably one of the key uh, eye-opening slides uh, relating to, to IDFs, in, in my opinion. I think, um, you know, anyone on this webinar should probably, you know, download the PDF uh, slides later and take a look at this uh, in more detail. But generally, the idea is that, you know, you have a, some level of blended federal tax rate and state or city income tax. Uh, with regards to California and New York residents and even Florida residents, because even though we don't have state tax, we do still pay the federal tax rate. Um, so when you see a, a, an asset manager's fact sheet and uh, they made 12% in a year, but it's not tax efficient, right? In, in the sense that you have to pay you know, your tax on that, that's actually a net of anywhere from you know, in this case, 5.71 up upwards of 7.31% um, net after-tax income. So taxes do eat a lot of your performance returns, um, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, and everyone wants to, you know, save taxes, have those returns compound at that full 12% as opposed to the seven. Um, and I think it's 
safe to say that if they're qualified purchasers, they most likely are in that top uh, tax bracket uh, for the most part. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, this illustration, you can see that through an IVF and a PPLI policy, even though it costs 80 basis points, uh, roughly of estimated annual insurance costs, um, you're saving all of the taxes uh, that you typically would pay at the federal and state or city level, um, getting you to a net uh, return, net tax return that's much higher than uh, what otherwise would be would be uh, considered. So uh, I'll pass that over to to Dave to to shed some more light on this or or fill in the gaps, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, no, Greg, you summed it summed it up well. Another way another way to describe. PPLI and PPVA is like structural arbitrage or tax arbitrage. You know, a lot of investors know what it is they want to invest into. And these structures enable clients to, to focus not on not only on what they want to invest in, into, but how they can make that investment to optimize their net of tax returns. So what, what the client's essentially doing is trading income taxes they would pay annually on the growth of their investment for insurance fees and costs. And oftentimes there's there's a meaningful meaningful arbitrage they can capture there, you know, with a PPLI contract, a life insurance. Over the long term, that that contract's fees and costs should nor should normalize out somewhere around 80 basis points, depending on the client's age and underwriting and what carrier is used. But that 80 basis points contrast that with what they would otherwise pay in federal, state, and city income taxes, and yeah, that trade-off can be can be significant. So. It gives clients optionality, especially if they live in higher income tax states. You know, even clients who live in high income tax states that maybe you know plan to retire in a lower income tax state. This is a way that you can accumulate and grow your assets tax efficiently and have optionality on on when and if you you pull money or surrender out of that contract and you'll potentially pay tax at that point. Um, the other thing I would add is is you know that trade off between insurance costs and taxes. It really depends on the tax profile of the underlying investment. So, you know, if the investment manager is like Adam and Silverview and they're they're doing private lending and that's generating all ordinary income, then the trade-off of investing through an IDF looks a lot more pronounced than it would look if if the client just desired a portfolio of you know buy and hold equities, which which you know may be lower turnover and you know maybe maybe would be treated you know with a different different tax rate. Um, just to um, someone ask a question here, should we take this question or we can take at the end and try to what do that say? You can take it now, that's fine. Um, they're asking that how much time it will take to establish and also um, the cost of maintaining the establishing the yeah, from from a timeline perspective, to create an IDF, if there are if there's investor demand and you know that ten million dollars is circled with a, with an insurance company, practically speaking, an IDF can be built in as little as two to three months. You know, there's the initial drafting of documents and due diligence that's completed on the the asset manager up front, and then likewise the insurance company will want to review the documents and that due diligence file as well when they on board and approve the IDF onto their platform. So two to three months is typical from a cost perspective um, for an asset manager to create an IDF. If they if they do it on their own and they don't use an administrator, then they're they're subject to you know whatever their law firm and outside providers will charge to build the IDF. Um, if Spearhead's acting as an administrator, we we typically don't charge an upfront fee. We just charge basis points on assets to administer the structure once it's funded and launched. Um, and then the pass-through costs of the IDF itself are, are, you know, by and large, other than administrative fee, they're the same as they would otherwise be for any other fund structure. You have your your NAV administrator, you have your auditor, any other providers to the IDF. Those would be pass-through costs of the structure. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Um, I think probably someone from accounting background is asking. For financial reporting purposes, are they typically reporting each IDF series as a separate set of financial statements? Okay. Yeah, that's correct. So each each IDF has its own independent EIN, has its own audit, has its own NAV, it's its own ring fence assets, ring fence set of assets and liabilities. 
So each, each IDF series is independent. Greg, good to go. Go ahead, please. Greg, you might be on mute. Greg, you are mute. Thanks, Kat. Um, Mohammed, I'll let you take this one. Elimination of K1s. I think uh, um, there's a big benefit to, to certain investors that investor base that don't want to deal with um, getting 25 or 30 K1s from all their private investments every year. Right. So this is another good advantage of having an idea. Yes, you're going to save on the on the tax savings to a very efficient tax structure, but also there is a less um, headache for your personal accountant. So, <laughs> so uh, even though IDF will issue the K-1s, they will go to the insurance company. I believe insurance company probably would not do anything after receiving it. If they're doing, um, uh, probably, I, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, they don't have to pay any, any tax on that. Perfect. So the underlying investor doesn't have to um, deal with all of the assets underneath the um, the IDF, right, or the PPLI policy. They don't have to deal with getting yeah. a whole slew of K1s throughout the year, um, trying to track that and pay those and, and file those. Right. Uh, so the, the third kind of benefit here um, is, the, you know, varying applications for different investor types. I think it, it really depends. There's other benefits to other types of tax exempt or, or um, tax quasi exempt investors. So I'll let uh, probably Dave take take that and speak to kind of the, the different investor types that could benefit from this. Sure, Greg. Um, so IDFs are probably best known as a tool for high net worth and family office clients. But as you alluded to, these, these funds also have applications in, in the institutional investor world. Um, foundations, endowments, and pensions, to the extent that they're allocating to investments that generate UBTI, so perhaps levered credit or real estate, they can, they can invest through an institutional version of PPVA into an IDF, and, and that variable annuity contract acts as a blocker of UBTI. So for some asset managers, they'll, they'll use their IDF, you know, similar to an offshore blocker structure where maybe it just creates additional efficiencies versus leveraging an offshore blocker. Um, likewise, non-US investors like sovereign wealth funds will utilize IDFs to make certain investments because, because the insurance chassis functions as a blocker of branch profits tax and ECI and FERPTA. And likewise, insurance companies, corporations, and banks, they, they can allocate to, to these funds through products called iColi, Coley and Coley, which can offer improved um, risk-based capital treatment on their assets in the case of insurance companies. With corporations and banks, these can be used for executive compensation plans or to improve the yield on certain investments. Um, so there is there is a very like pronounced but but less commonly understood application for IDFs with larger institutions. Perfect. Uh, Adam, do you have anything to add on, on this? point before we move on no i do i think it's a growth area and an expansion area for us we have some of these types of investors in our traditional funds um and and you know it's something that uh, frankly i learned at a, at a recent idf conference the the ability to utilize these tools um so it, it may be a good fit for some of our our existing clients in our taxable fund accessing um you know the silver view suite of funds via the idf yeah, to avoid um, all of those nasty UBTI, UCI, all the other uh, yeah, acronyms the that we don't blockers. like. Yeah, we, we do have the offshore blockers, so thankfully we, yeah. we don't have to deal with that. Um, but I think there are some advantages, as, as, you know, especially for the insurance company uh, type investors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I have a quick question for Dave. Um, when IDF work as a blocker, um, also for UBTI, uh, do you structure this in an offshore environment, the offshore domicile, or how do you structure to avoid UBTI? Yeah. yeah, so so UBTI blocking using IDF, typically the, the institutional client, the foundation, endowment, pension, or other tax exempt organization will fund a, a group variable annuity. Oftentimes that's funded through a Bermuda based insurance carrier, but that mm -hmm. Bermuda based insurance carrier then invests in the manager's your traditional IDF vehicle. 
So, the, so those institutional clients can invest in the same IDF as other high net worth or family office clients you know, of, the, of the asset manager. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Test time. All right. Let's see who did their homework. Uh, another polling question. So I'm going to just launch this. Yeah. There we go. I'm going to close the poll in the next few seconds. I feel like we need the um, Jeopardy music theme. <laughs> Playing that in my head, the Jeopardy music as that's going. Um, Most of the people answered C option. I believe that is correct. Perfect. That means um, we're doing our job. Um, so, Cons of insurance dedicated fund structure. Um, so, uh, Dave, I'll, I'll give this one over to you, and then um, you know, Adam, maybe uh, get your thoughts on this as well at the end. Sure, Greg. And by, by cons, I, I would preface this: this is more like considerations for IDFs, <laughs> things things for investors to be aware of if they're considering allocating to an IDF, or for an asset manager considering creating one. Um, first and foremost is investor control, and, and this is this is probably the biggest pushback by why for for some ultra wealthy clients IDFs don't make sense. Um, they have to give up full discretion of that IDF to that investment manager. So while a client is allowed to fund one of these insurance contracts and then select the underlying investment manager that oversees the assets inside that contract. The, the client's not allowed to, to instruct the investment manager or pick and choose specific assets that go into that IDF, that there has to be a, a sort of a layer of separation where the, the service provides a tremendous amount, tremendous amount of tax benefits through these structures, but clients have to give up something at the end of the day, and, and that's investor control. So, you know, they, they can pick the, pick the strategy, they can pick the manager, but then it's hands off from there. And, and you know, the, the investor is really their only control at that point is that they can they can walk, walk from the IDF if they so choose. So if an investor were to wake up one day and you know they, they weren't happy with an IDF's performance or they wanted to pivot to a different investment strategy, they, they could always redeem from that IDF inside their contract and you know pick a different IDF offered by the carrier. But you know that, that investment discretion and all investment selection has to be controlled by that that IDF manager. And then, um, Greg, you want me to hit 817H diversification too? Yeah, yeah, might as well. And then, um, and then we'll get the asset manager's point of view after that. Yeah, yeah. And with, with 817H diversification, it, it essentially says that the IDF has to hold at least five underlying line items or assets in the portfolio, where no single asset inside the portfolio represents more than 55% of the assets. No two represent more than 70, no three more than 80, no four more than 90. So they have to be at least five underlying line items or assets in that IDF. So hypothetically speaking, you couldn't, you couldn't create an IDF and put 100% of the assets into Apple stock. That being said, Apple could represent up to 55% of the portfolio, and then you could, you could layer in additional positions to, to properly diversify the portfolio. And those positions could be stocks, they could be bonds, Mutual funds, hedge funds, private funds, potentially private deals or, or you know, loans in the case of Silverview. Um, so different ways that you can meet, meet that test. Dave, I have a question on that actually. Um, if you, I'm sure that I know kind of the answer of this, but if you were to decide to put something together for, as you mentioned, Apple stock, right? But let's say you were looking at bonds. If you were to buy, different bonds 
from the same company, would that be considered um, different allocations under this test, or would it be considered a single allocation? Yeah, you know, we've we've seen we've seen IDF created where a manager will build a, a portfolio of bonds. Typically, those bonds are all issued by different different agencies, though. Like if if they're government agencies, so I, I mean, we would treat it on a case by case basis, and and a lot of this would boil down to what is this something that the carrier would get comfortable with? But um, gen generally speaking, we treat it as as like bonds issued by different companies or government agencies. Yeah, yeah. So if you, if you had like very similar bonds, just different uh, vintages of Apple bonds, right, that you're buying, then it would it would potentially be considered one allocation because it's all the same company or issued by the same company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is another question here, and I also have a one question for myself. Um, first is let's ask what the uh, attendees are asking. They are asking, I don't understand. What advantage an already tax exempt investor would get by investing in IDF, which won't give them any additional tax advantage? I think you were trying to refer to the UBTI tax. I believe, but yes. Yeah, so so for for tax exempt investors, they can invest in an IDF through what's called a, a group variable annuity or a, a group annuity contract issued out of out of Bermuda or similar jurisdiction. Now, why would they do that versus just investing through an offshore blocker? Um, first and foremost, it, it eliminates a lot of the like regulatory filings for for the end client associated with that investment. They simply own an investment through an insurance contract, and so administratively, it's it's simpler for a lot of allocators. And to creating an IDF, the cost slippage associated with that annuity contract may be less than what they are otherwise paying in either tax leakage or cost leakage associated with that offshore blocker structure you know, registration offshore, having an offshore board of directors, et cetera. So it's, it's very much a case by case situation, but it, it, it is a it is a, a commonly utilized tool. Like over half of the, the Ivy League endowments today utilize IDFs in some shape or form for, for certain investments, as well as I believe 60 to 60 or 70 of the largest endowments in the US. Good to know. Then my my question is, what is the is there any any penalty if they miss the diversification test, or what are the consequences of not meeting the diversification test? Yeah, it, it, I mean, worst case scenario, if if an IDF is out of diversification and it's not caught and fixed, I mean, this the service could treat this as a taxable investment to to a the end client, and they could be responsible for paying income tax dollars because their income tax on their investment dollars because this wouldn't wouldn't be blessed under the internal revenue code as a true idf um now that now when an asset manager creates an idf they they report to an insurance carrier on a consistent basis showing that the idf is properly diversified furthermore if they if they ever break a diversification test they have a set amount of time to fix the portfolio so hopefully it's something that that never happens um and also an asset manager will never be penalized if they pick an investment and it explodes in value or it goes to zero so as long as when they build that portfolio it's properly diversified their their the structure is considered coaster in in the eyes of the carriers thank you very helpful and adam um you know anything to add or anything from from your side um you know, in terms of diversification, how does that play into kind of your investment philosophy and what you guys are doing? Yeah, no, certainly something to keep in mind and, and something to be mindful, uh, you know, of. Uh, it was a big consideration at, at inception when we first spoke about it. You know, we typically close a transaction every month. Um, and so we, we just wanted to make sure that we had a, a good pipeline before, you know, pulling the trigger that we wouldn't run into any issues here in the diversification. So I think if it's a strategy that, maybe isn't actively trading something or having a large portfolio, um, just something to be aware of. Um, but yeah, we, we, we had no issues with, with hitting, the, uh, hitting the diversification, but definitely something to be aware of. Yeah, I, I imagine that would be even more complicated at the beginning when you, you know, frankly have, you're starting from scratch, right? With cash right. coming in and you gotta put out certain positions. Um, yeah, great. 
I, I would add one thing. When a manager launches an IDF, technically they have 364 days before they're beholden to that diversification test. Okay. So yeah. if they're allocating to illiquid asset classes, they can scale into that portfolio over time. You know, they just have to Got be it. just mindful of, you know, how much money is there inside the IDF that they can play with, that they can they can parcel out to different investments. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Cash might be uh, not an asset that's considered for, you know, if you if you had a, a portion of cash, it's not considered for that diversification, I would imagine. That's right. Yeah. So. Uh, segregated asset base. So the IDF can only accept investments from insurance companies and an IDF cannot be a share class of an existing fund. So you can't just set up a share class of your fund and say that's an IDF. You have to, it has to be a standalone structure. Um, hence, its, own, its applicability with investors are limited to clients who either already own or in, intend to fund a new PPLI or PPVA contract. So, um, you know, Dave, does that does that mean that if you intend to fund a PPLI contract, you can invest in an IDF first, or do you have to set up the PPLI contract and then invest in the IDF? Yeah, yeah. The client has to has to set up and fund the IDF contract first, and to do so, they need to work with a, a properly licensed insurance agent. So, if you look sort of nationwide, there are a litany of insurance agents that focus on this marketplace specifically, and work with broker dealers that, that have selling agreements with the various carriers and, and are knowledgeable about structuring these contracts properly. So first step is, is structure the contract. In the case of PPLI, that'll involve a medical underwriting, not dissimilar from, from underwriting associated with any other traditional insurance contract the client might acquire. And then once that contract's in place with the carrier and premiums are funded to the carrier, then the client can direct those assets into you know, one or more IDFs. Great, thanks. And um, next slide, please, Mohammed. We have another uh, polling. I just launched a third polling question. Okay. Uh, majority of the people responded B, but uh, I think it should be A, right? Dave, you know better. You, you said 55 percent. Yep, should, should be A. Um, IDF must have a minimum of five underlying assets. Um, as, are, as it pertains to B, no single asset can represent more than 55 percent of the overall IDF portfolio. So it seems like the trick this time, so they're not able to answer. Right. And it's, I think, is it two or three assets that can't make up more than 70%, Dave? Uh, two assets, 70%. Right. Got it. You can blame that one on the teacher. If that many people got the question wrong, that's probably. <laughs> no worries. Um, okay, so let's conclude this. Perfect. So, conclusion there are definite pros and cons to the IDF structures. Uh, for certain investors, an IDF can help them to maximize their net of tax returns tremendously over the long term, uh, especially with compounding, right? So you think about not paying all these taxes and then compounding um, at the gross rate, not not dissimilar to, to an IRA or a 401k or other types of tax beneficial um, you know, structures. Uh, that said, creating an IDF also requires an investment in time and resources by the asset manager to both build the structure as well as educate potential investors as to the benefits of that structure. Um, managers who are exploring this space are encouraged to build relationships with experienced insurance carriers, service providers, and insurance providers who can help them navigate the ins and outs. So 
I can speak from personal experience. Um, you know, we do a lot of complex fund structuring here at Fund Use. Um, you know, I my my thoughts on this space is if you don't want to dedicate your entire, you know, lifetime career, you know, years and years, because it's such a long term um, approach to growing your wealth or growing your clients' wealth. You know, I think it's very important that you pick the right providers that are going to be around 5, 10, 20 years from now and and really have your best interest at heart, especially when it comes to giving up control or partial control of your own your own destiny, your own investment. Um, you know, that's that's my personal take on it. Uh, I think that if if you find a group or groups like that that you're very comfortable with, that you really believe, um, you know, have your best interest at heart. Um, you know, such as Dave from Spearhead and the Spearhead team, I think it is a tremendous tool for ultra high net worth. And I think more asset managers should really look at this, um, you know, look at this option, especially if they have, depending on their client base, right? If, you, if you're an asset manager with a whole bunch of very small high net worth or, or accredited but not QP investors, it may not make sense to look at it at that point in time. But as you build more and more relationships with qualified purchasers, ultra high net worth that may be interested in this, I think it would make sense to, to maybe take a soft poll of how many of those clients would be interested in an IDS structure. Um, so I'll stop there. And I think it's important we get everyone's um, concluding thoughts on this. Dave, I don't know if you wanna add anything or conclude anything. Greg, I think you summed it up pretty well. It's for the asset manager, this is another arrow in your quiver. And it's not, it's typically, it's not a structure that you build right off the bat and, and then try and raise capital around. It's really a response to investor and client demand. Um, but it's it's a useful tool for, for the right asset manager in the right client situation. And you guys alluded to earlier, it's a growing marketplace. You know, Millennium, Bain, Apollo have all launched products in this space. You'll see that trickle down. I mean, even Silverview is the opposite example of a, a smaller size manager that's able to enter this space, which is telling that, you know, it, it, as long as as long as you meet those minimal requirements that the carriers, you can enter into this marketplace. And as long as you can circle up that initial seed capital. Um, but there, there are positive headwinds around this marketplace. And as awareness for these solutions grow, this marketplace will continue to grow. Perfect. And Mohammed, any uh, any thoughts on your end? Um, I would say that <clears throat> I pretty much uh, I like what uh, both of you guys are saying. I, I think it is a growing space. We were not involved in the idea a few years ago, but we are involved. Thank you to you and uh, Jay um, giving us an opportunity to do some idea audits. Very happy and exciting. I think. This is a need of the hour. I believe uh, tax rates will go higher and higher because of a budget deficit and, and very financially savvy and uh, sophisticated investors need to get involved in those kind of products and there will be more work for accountants and auditors and fund admin to help them out. Um, I have another question someone is asking, but I will ask after Adam's. You know, we'll take questions after the conclusion. So, concluding thoughts, Adam, uh, what do you have to add here? Look, it, it, it makes a ton of sense for, for those joining us today uh, to, to learn more about IDFs. We've got great resources. Um, I know that the four of us would be happy to get on the phone and talk with anybody about our experiences and, and give them their thoughts and, and uh, on the IDF structure. So, I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak uh, and, and learn, frankly, from all of you today um, and in the past. Um, so thank you very much. It's a, it's an incredible product. Perfect. So now we'll open up the questions. I'll let Mohammed uh, take it away. Yeah. So it's the last question, I believe. <clears throat> um, so they're asking, how are the audit firms typically drafting the audit engagement letter? Would the engagement letter have to be drafted for each actual series and the IDF or just for the IDF? I know the answer, but let Dave answer first. Yeah, the, the audit firm will, will engage with the investment manager for each series. So each each series is considered its own separate audit. Um, I don't know if you have additional thoughts or if I answered that sufficiently. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are spot on. I just don't, I don't want to steal your shine. So. 
I don't want to steal the thunder from you guys because you guys are very um, earlier in this space for emerging managers. There are a lot of products available in the market uh, for the idea, but you guys are geared towards em emerging managers too and helping them in addition to sophisticated managers. This is our bread and butter too. So we work with emerging managers. So I believe your answer is correct. Each series is a separate entity. And, and, and under that idea of structure, you can have multiple series, multiple auditors can work with a different, different series, whatever they choose. They don't have to have to audit all the series in the idea of structure. That's correct. Yeah. And, and at Spearhead, we, we administer a, a multi-series IDF structure. And so when we create a new series with, with a investment manager, or as, or as we refer to them as sub advisor, we'll, we'll carve off that series, name them as the sub advisor to make all investment decisions. And then, and then we as manager and investment manager, that structure, we engage with the auditor on behalf of the series. But, you know, if, if, hypothetically speaking, an asset manager could also build an IDF on their own and, and, Likewise, they would be engaging with Mohammed or, or the other auditors and service providers to the IDF. Um, um, one question I have for you at the end, Dave, have you seen um, emerging managers launching a fund without spearhead or um, third party administrator um, doing, getting in, in, involved? There's a value for your services, and I believe they should do that. And insurance companies get comfortable, but how practical it is for them to launch without your help? Yeah, it's a great question. A majority of fund managers that launch structures in the space will partner with a third party administrator like Spearhead. Um, one, we have a, a, a turnkey set of offering documents that we can utilize in, in drafting the IDF's documents, getting the IDF created. We have existing relationships with the insurance companies. Insurance companies understand how we report on IDFs and, and what deliverables we provide to them. And so for a sort of ease of process and speed to launch, there are definite advantages to working with an administrator, um, but that, that doesn't stop an asset manager from creating an IDF on their own and working with outside legal counsel. It's just, it's just gonna require additional investment in upfront costs to, to get the IDF created and additional uh, personnel hours to get up to speed on the marketplace and and really sort of get your get your name out there in the marketplace. Build those relationships with the insurance companies. I think is a big value add, right? Yeah. And uh, some some insurance companies will only work with IDFs that are administered by by third party admins. So. But who selects the insurance companies? Investors, or I'm sorry, what's that? Who we select insurance carrier? Who they want to work with? Yes, yeah, so, so the client will select the insurance carrier, um, and they'll do that in concert with a licensed insurance professional that assists them in structuring their contract. And depending on the client's investment goals, if one IDF is only offered on one carrier, they they'll likely fund their contract at that carrier so they can access the IDF. Um, although IDFs can be added to other carriers over time. So it's really, it's really an exercise between the client and the insurance professional to determine you know, what, what insurance product and which carrier is the best fit for them. I have to ask this last polling question, which is not really technical, but they, in order to get the CPs, they have to answer three out of four. Give me a minute. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, they have responded. That was only all to listening and they said yes. So I think let's conclude this thing. Um, Greg, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, thanks Dave from Spearhead and, and Mohammed from Akram and, and Adam from Silverview. Um, if anyone wants to get a hold of anyone on this webinar, please reach out via email, LinkedIn, however you can get a hold of us. Um, I, I, know, I know all of these uh, folks personally, and they're all willing to talk to pretty much anyone so, um, about what they do and their experiences. So, 
Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Perfect. Thanks. I think we're good to go. Dave, I had one. Oh, Dave's gone. <laughs> it's good to see Adam. <laughs> good luck with the house build. We'll catch up soon. Sounds great. Take care, buddy. Appreciate it. Happy Bye. New Year. Bye. You too. Bye. I can figure out how to get out of this thing.